Welcome to the Vernon Hills Update. The update offers information about a variety of village services. You'll meet a few of your neighbors and you'll find out about upcoming events. On today's show, we'll sit down with Lake County Board Chairman Aaron Lawler for an update on county level initiatives, including the county budget report and Route 53 expansion efforts. We'll stop by the Vernon Hills Public Works Department to talk about the village's preparations and procedures for dealing with wintry road conditions. And we'll formally meet our community's new finance director, Nikki Larson, who takes the helm upon the retirement of longtime director, Larry Nackren. Thank you for tuning in to the Vernon Hills Update. Well, as we begin this year, it seems like a good time to kind of take a broader view of issue, issues that impact the village of Vernon Hills. So today we're going to look at things from the county level, from the level of Lake County, Illinois. And we happen to be joined by Aaron Lawler. He is our elected representative to District 18 in mm -hmm. Lake County. That's our district. And he's also the Lake County Board Chairman. So when Aaron comes to visit, we get a lot of good information. So thanks for taking the time, Aaron. I know you guys are busy. You're running around. But uh, thanks for taking the time to kind of give us an update on things at the county level. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Well, and you've been uh, working uh, on our behalf at Lake County for, for years now, really. When did you first get elected? Uh, I was appointed to fill a vacancy in July of 2009, and I've been on the county board since then. Um, I was elected chairman in December of 2012, so I'm in my second term as chairman. Mm -hmm. But before that, I was uh, on the Cook Memorial Library Board and real involved in the village. And you are really involved in the village. So that's one thing that's really nice to know that uh, somebody's got kind of the, the, the eye and the ear for Vernon Hills mm -hmm. all the time. So thank you for that, as, as well as taking care for everybody in, in the county. So before we start with that Lake County overview, um, could, could we do kind of like a mini civics lesson? Because there's sure. so many governmental agencies and doing different things, but how many people are there uh, at the Lake County elected official level? What's, what, what, what's that look like? So we have eight countywide elected officials, and those are uh, your county clerk, the sheriff, the recorder of deeds, the coroner, uh, the regional superintendent of schools, uh, the circuit court clerk, the treasurer, uh, and others. And then you have the county board, which is 21 members that are each elected from different districts uh, that represent about 34,000, 35,000 people um, in different parts of the county. So what the county board is primarily responsible for is our county budget, but it advances our strategic goals, uh, which include uh, health, uh, law and safety, uh, judicial issues, transportation, economic development. And so it's really what the county does. I, I described it to folks as it's all those things that when they're working, you don't really notice okay. them. But when the water isn't flowing or the roads aren't paved or the streets aren't safe, uh, you sure do notice them. And so we really work hard to provide a high level of service in a, a cost-effective manner. And it's also things that are, are really in, interrelated that residents may not notice. If we don't have healthy people, we're not going to have a strong workforce and a vibrant economy. And so being able to look at all these issues and how they fit together and how we can advance quality of life in Lake County is really important. And, and Lake County being that overarching, I mean, how many people did you say live in this in this area when you call it Lake County? We have 703,000 people that okay. live here and we have a workforce of 400,000 okay. people. So we've, we're actually a, a place where people travel in to work here for, for, for all the different industries. So we're, we're, we're a gatherer rather than people leaving out. So. We're 11 Fortune 500 headquarters and 30,000 businesses. So yeah. we are an employment hub. That's nice. That's nice to have those, that kind of base here. Um, now, when we talked about that budget being so important, that one mm -hmm. of the things you have to do is you have to uh, make priorities in all those other things. And I heard you say, you know, law enforcement and water and the health department and all those things. Mm -hmm. how, does, how does that budget process come together? Is that, is that the, the season we're in right now for you guys, or what's that looking like? So we recently adopted our budget uh, in November. Uh, so we have our, our 2016 budget done. Uh, we're really happy to report it's $7 million less than it was last year. Uh, we froze our property tax levy uh, this year. Uh, we've done that in the past strategically when we see that uh, you know, we can kind of make ends mm -hmm. meet without having to raise our property tax levy. That's always a good thing. Mm -hmm. But we've really invested in a lot of efforts to make county government more efficient by implementing technology, 
um, sharing services with other units of government, and we've strategically uh, reduced our workforce primarily through attrition uh, and efficiency by 13 percent. So 13 percent fewer people work for the county today than 10 years ago. Okay, it, but like you said, it wasn't it wasn't through like mass layoffs or, or yeah. crisis. It was just planning ahead and becoming more efficient. We had some very very small layoffs mm -hmm. in in 2009 when uh, the economic downturn really mm -hmm. hit, but that was. Mm -hmm. um, in, in the realm of 19 to 20 people, not large mass layoffs. Okay. And when, when we talk about the budget too, I know um, here in Vernon Hills, we have our eye to Springfield mm -hmm. and, and the things going on or not going on in Springfield and how that impacts money flowing back in. Does Lake County have that same situation where, the, you know, the domino effect, what happens here impacts everyone? It, it does. We will spend as a part of our FY16 budget $414 uh, million dollars uh, and 123 million of that comes from or through the state of okay. Illinois. So 80 million of it is general revenue, that's your sales tax, uh, motor fuel tax, other uh, revenues mm -hmm. that are collected through the state and then passed on to us. And then we have 50 million dollars that are either federal pass-through money, at 16 million, and the rest are grants, Medicaid reimbursements and other things. Mm -hmm. uh, the county health department is a large part of our budget. It's about 29 percent of our budget. They serve 44,000 people through their mm -hmm. uh, primary care uh, division. That's those that are less fortunate, uh, mm -hmm. that maybe don't have the ability to pay, might be on Medicaid. So a lot of the services we provide to them, we rely on state grants for cancer screenings, uh, dental care for lo uh, for low-income veterans, things like that. As the state budget uh, hopefully comes to a yeah. resolution, I think we're going to see additional cuts. And so we'll have to go back and really understand the impact of those because mm -hmm. we cannot absorb all of those cuts. Mm -hmm. We've got a AAA bond rating. We're one of 40 counties, about 40 counties out of 3,000 in the country that have that credit rating. Mm -hmm. We want to maintain that. And, and we certainly can't absorb everything as much as we would want to. Yeah, that's and, and that's the same conversation we're having here in the village level. And you know, you're planning ahead for that, and you're hoping things kind of start coming together mm -hmm. so that log log jam kind of frees up. But yeah. So let's let's talk about you. You said uh, the health department is such a huge part of the budget, and it serves so many people in the county. Um, and most of those facilities, they are around the county. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of them are focused up in in the Waukegan area, but there are places around the county. So if somebody who's watching needs services, you know, contact somebody because they can help you get connected to those services. Mm -hmm. What are some of those other uh, major uh, is, is, is police, is that a big thing? Water, what, what are some of the other big ones that you're, you're really focusing on? So court services is about 28 percent of our budget. That includes uh, the courts, the criminal and civil courts, uh, which hopefully people don't have to use, but they are there. Uh, the state's attorney, the public defender, the coroner, uh, the sheriff, all of those services. For, for Vernon Hills, though, I think one of the number one things that impacts um, their daily life that the county has a role in is our public works department. So all of our residents and businesses are on Lake County water. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we pump 1.8 billion gallons a year through mm -hmm. Lake County uh, public works systems. And so that's, that's also a very big job in maintaining that system. Uh, the other place where we're making a very strategic investment is in transportation. We live in traffic, unfortunately, in Lake County, and we're really working hard to make an investment to, uh, to optimize our regional transportation system. And that includes building new lanes and capacity, improving intersections, but also better implementing technology and how we can network all of our lights and intersections to be able to improve traffic flow through better uses of technology. Well, now, uh, uh, several months back, I know uh, Mike Stordo and I got to go visit one of the uh, the switching places where they were looking at a lot of the lights. They, mm -hmm. they had cameras so they could see where things were going bad. So have, have you been Im improving upon that? Is that, the, is that light timing or what is what is going on there on that? It's, it's basically, uh, it's all done through our Transportation Nerve Center, which is our, our Transportation Management uh, Center in Libertyville. Mm -hmm. That's probably where you were. Yep. And we do have uh, over 500 lights networked. And we've done that over time. So we're 
uh, each year adding more and more lights. But now there's actually new technology called adaptive uh, intersections. And what it does is they are super smart, is what our county engineer says. <laughs> They're not just regular smart <laughs> like the other ones. And they can just better sense changes in traffic flow uh, if traffic flow changes as a result of maybe a state or federal holiday when less people are going to work, it senses that it can make changes uh, to the light timing so people aren't sitting there you know, with no traffic nothing, going yeah. by and wondering why the lights aren't changing. Oh, interesting. So you're going to start rolling that out to mm -hmm. the different intersections and as we go. Exactly. Is that something you, you have to test that sort of thing? or We did. We had a pilot with um, two or four intersections mm -hmm. last year, and so we wanted to make sure the new technology worked for our area, and so it's something we'll be rolling out okay. more and more. That's that's uh, that's interesting to know, and I think we had we had read about that. It's mm -hmm. like it, it's the sort of thing that we'd like to see, like in front of the mall, like on those <laughs> days when you're stopping at all the lights there. So, yeah. um, so uh, it's uh, um, as far as budgeting then. So, you're balanced. Mm -hmm. It's lower than it was before. Mm -hmm. A little dependent on what's going on down in Springfield, as we all are. So ready to revisit. Um, but those, but at this point, you're you're be able to maintain those services. So it isn't like we're having a service cutback time or anything like that. No, but we also look at workload on a, an, an annual basis. I think a lot of times people look at government and they think that maybe we don't evaluate things like their employers in the private sector might. Mm -hmm. We've got a very robust performance management system where we look at the investment that we're making in different programs and really look to optimize those outcomes. And mm -hmm. if they're not performing, we look at how we can reprogram dollars okay. or find efficiencies. So it isn't just a one-time a year thing. You're looking at that stuff all the time. That's an ongoing uh, yeah. process. Yeah. Our department heads, we have, we have um, not beaten it into them, but we have <laughs> demonstrated from a county board and from a leadership perspective but that this type of mentality should permeate everything mm -hmm. that we do. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's um, as you say, it's so nice to know that Lake County services work so well because mm -hmm. we don't notice those things. Um, for instance, even the water. We've got the pumping station over in mm -hmm. Deer Path Park. We just get our water, and it's nice to know, but you, you have to touch and, and manipulate all of that. So thank you to, to your crews and all the people that are and making sure it's And it's interesting. Works. I've actually gotten my, my hands dirty uh, mm -hmm. at our Public Works Department at that pumping site in Deer Path Park. Mm -hmm. We took it apart for routine maintenance. I removed a clog, saw the <laughs> cooking grease and other debris that gets stuck oh. in there, cleaned it, uh, put it back together. Then we went over to the water reclamation facility okay. in Vernon Hills where we had to do some maintenance, and I was down in the trenches uh, doing a lot of work there. Uh, it, it's a neat thing uh, that we've started. It's called Dirty Jobs, <laughs> uh, but it gives county residents a kind of unique behind-the-scenes look at what we do because mm -hmm. a lot of them don't know right it, it like the work that gets done and you see the trucks go w when they're needed I, I see them go through the park it might be in the middle of the night it might mm -hmm. be on a holiday if they need to be there they're there so yeah. thank you for that um, as far as uh, one of the things you were talking about being roadways being a priority mm -hmm. um, that leads us to talk about route 53 which at this point kind of comes up from the north uh, from the south to the north and mm -hmm. then sort of ends yep but that has been something that's been in the plans and the works for years and years there's mm -hmm. big if you you fly over uh, the land you've shown me pictures where you can see the path that road was meant to take years ago. How are we coming on that? I know you've been working hard to meet with groups and, and do a lot of planning and, and conversation about that. Where, where does that stand? Well, it's closer than it's ever been. And the reason it's closer than it's ever been is we do have a, a broad group of stakeholders that we've been engaging from the environmental community, all of the other communities. There's a couple opponents out there uh, that are right along uh, where the roadway would go, mm -hmm. and, and certainly that's understandable. But what we've really tried to do to mitigate concerns is actually create a set of recommendations that are over and above how the tollway would address environmental mitigation uh, and stewardship. So it's things like uh, enhanced standards for water runoff, light pollution, noise pollution, water quality, um, the uh, environmental remediation when it comes to plant life and mm -hmm. things like that, and then providing additional resources for uh, open space preservation, trail connections, to really see mm -hmm. this as part of a natural ecosystem a, um, and not just a road project. Mm -hmm. um, so the tollway actually 
this month is voting on uh, an environmental impact statement. And that's where people's eyes might glaze over because it becomes a very uh, bureaucratic process. But it's the next step where they're going to be looking at different design alternatives, looking at those environmental uh, considerations mm -hmm. that are absolutely critical. Um, we've set forth a set of principles and recommendations that we feel need to be the intellectual framework that governs uh, this roadway and how it needs to be built, but they're going to evaluate those uh, and see whether or not they're feasible, both from an engineering standpoint, but also a financing standpoint. Mm -hmm. And then it'll be up to the tollway. But the bottom line is, we cannot build this roadway uh, in a traditional six-lane uh, fashion. It's got to be an innovative parkway like we've laid out uh, with this group. That's what I've committed to the public and it's important mm -hmm. that we live up to that. Well, and let, let's talk just a minute more about those, all those different stakeholders that you've mm -hmm. been, you've been having, you know, kind of public meetings and you've been sharing the story and people have give, been giving input for months now. Mm -hmm. And it, is that the group then that came up with the, kind of the, the blue ribbon idea of how, you know, we best think that this could work? Um, that group together, and, and I know you've gotten municipalities involved mm -hmm. and you've gotten support from all uh, different mayors and things like that. So what kind of group does that look like then? So it's been three groups and, okay. and uh, all very productive ones. The Blue Ribbon Group was a, a group of stakeholders that included local and regional thought leaders to talk about these innovations mm -hmm. that we could um, put into the project that would uh, get us to a point that we've never been before. So that was the initial work. Mm -hmm. And then that uh, report called for a few things to happen. One was that a finance committee be brought together and then a land use committee be brought together. Uh, they would study the funding for the project and then also what the land use vision for the area is. Because when you put in a new roadway like this, it's really important for us to start planning together uh, because the collective impact of all of our local decisions when it comes to development uh, make a big difference. And so we want to plan smart for this roadway uh, so that it is part of our vision for the vibrant uh, Lake County that we all want to see. And those groups included mayors, uh, environmental groups like Open Lands and the Liberty Prairie Foundation, as well as all of the mayors uh, or their designees from the different communities uh, mm -hmm. that are along the Route 53 and 120 corridor. Mm -hmm. One quick thing, we see, we see this as a 12 mile extension from Lake Cook Road to Route 120, but an integral part of the project is the 120 bypass, which is another 12 mile stretch that bypasses the existing Route 120 uh, roadway and would uh, divert traffic further east and further west. Okay. So that's a really important part of the traffic mitigation uh, goals. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, so it's bigger than 53. It impacts to the north. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the, the mayors that were involved before we started rolling tape. You said you've really gotten solid support from the majority of the mayors. What was mm -hmm. that, that uh, how that shook out? So myself and 40 out of 52 mayors in the county signed a letter uh, to the Tollway Board asking them to further study this project mm -hmm. and do this environmental mm -hmm. impact uh, okay. statement work. I think that's really impressive. Mm -hmm. Getting 40 mayors to agree on anything <laughs> together is a challenge yeah. and so it was certainly a big accomplishment. But it's also important to look at this not just as a Lake County project, this is a regional proje project with a large regional benefit. Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning, which is the premier planning group in, in uh, the Chicago area, notes that this is the most important infrastructure project in their GOTO 2040 plan when it comes to traffic mitigation and economic development opportunities. Mm -hmm. So we've received support not just from our local Lake County leaders, but leaders in McHenry, Cook, DuPage, um, and Will County, among others. Mm -hmm. and, and because it is, um, the, the impact is going to be huge just because if you can move people around and you can take some of that pressure off some of the other roads and it, 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 it handles uh, all these businesses that are here and need people to be able to move around efficiently and effectively to get to work. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Do you have numbers that show 
what kind of impact that would have on some of our economies up here? Is that part of any of this planning? So from a, a time perspective, uh, in 2040 projections, uh, that's the time frame they use, mm -hmm. it would save somebody 30 minutes from going uh, from Gray's Lake to Schaumburg in a peak in a peak travel time. So significant opportunity for time savings. Mm -hmm. It's also a large opportunity for economic growth. Uh, we had a firm out of Chicago do a detailed market analysis mm -hmm. and identified $19 billion in economic impact from the construction of this road and related development, as well as the potential to uh, generate 25 to 30,000 new jobs. Now what that does is not just a opportunity for us to look at traffic, but it also diversifies our county's tax base. Uh, if we have a tax base uh, like we do in the central part of the county that's very reliant on residential uh, properties, that's going to put a disproportionate amount of that tax burden on our homeowners versus being able to diversify it to businesses and really improve uh, the health of our tax base that's going to make a big difference for our schools and our mm -hmm. other taxing mm -hmm. bodies out in that area. It's another way to another way to boost the economies, especially in those those the, those towns and villages to the north and west of us, who would mm -hmm. would benefit because you could get people back and forth. They could come and shop there. They could come and work there. Yeah, the reason that businesses aren't locating there now is is access. They mm -hmm. don't have good access to transportation, mm -hmm. and so you see a lot of green fields that are zoned commercial that aren't getting just development. Sitting, just waiting. Yeah. And, and waiting because these plans have been in the works for a while, so they know hopefully someday, someday. <laughs> so as we talk about this, so we've got uh, the environmental impact study being done by the tollway. Um, what comes next? Is that a long process? Do they come back to the county and say this is what we have, or do they just then move forward and you try to um, help shape that vision? It, it, from this point out, it really becomes a tollway project for them to evaluate both on the environmental engineering and financing mm -hmm. um, issues that we've discussed. The key role for the county to play is to ensure that the Blue Ribbon Standards, those enhanced environmental and community protections are being included in the project because that is the only way that I believe the project can go forward. So we're going to kind of play uh, a watchdog in that and then collaborate uh, with the tollway, with local partners. You don't get something like this done um, by just punting it to, to mm -hmm. one group and say, go We're do done. this. Yeah, so you're not done. Yeah, <laughs> but it's a two-year process, and the exciting thing for members of the public that want to get involved is there will be a robust opportunity for people to submit comments online, at public meetings, to get educated on this and understand and we've actually gotten commitments from the tollway and the Illinois Department of Transportation that we're going to have an even more substantive public engagement process, uh, include more stakeholder groups than what's required by federal okay. law. So, and they've committed to that. So yes. we can. So we'll have to touch base with you so we keep getting that information mm -hmm. so people who want to know more can, can stay in the loop on yep. that. Now, before we started talking, too, we said, what if this doesn't go? Mm -hmm. What if the tollway either, you know, for whatever reason, um, what if it flounders again? We still have needs here for, for moving people around. Mm -hmm. And I know you said the alternatives um, are, not, are, are not without uh, uh, some pain, because mm -hmm. you were mentioning, like, one of the things might be to uh, widen Butterfield and the cost and the heart ache that that would be is huge. It, it is. When we looked at all of the alternatives that would be needed in order to build out that north-south um, mm -hmm. arterial roadway that, that we need, it's widening 56.2 miles of roads and actually constructing 14.6 uh, miles of new roads. The, the one example in our area would be to widen Butterfield Road from four to six lanes. We'd have to do the same in uh, Kildeer on mm -hmm. Quinton Road, build it four to six lanes. Mm -hmm. And I want to be very clear for, for folks that are watching, we only looked at those projects that would be needed if 53 isn't yeah. built. Mm -hmm. There are a number of roadways that need substantial improvement with or without 53, mm -hmm. 
and we're working with our mayors and our state legislators on those priorities. Mm -hmm. Things like widening Route 45, uh, oh. <laughs> widening 6083. These yeah. are big projects that impact our residents as well. Yeah, they are big projects, and, and I know everything takes time. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of steps involved, and then the money doesn't, you know, that, that's no small feat either. Yeah. So, so I know that's something, if you want to talk more about that, if you want to learn more and have a conversation with Aaron about that, uh, you, you've got a lot of background. You can give people a lot of information yep. that they can go and do some more homework on it. That's Route 53. That's mm -hmm. pretty exciting because it's something that's been talked about for a long time, but like you said, it's never been this much of a reality where it seems like it's like we're getting close. We're yeah. getting close. So thank you for that. Um, also, another thing that you've been working on, uh, Leadership Lake County. I know mm -hmm. one of the times that uh, we talked, it, it, you have found it to be important that we, um, that people who grow up here can stay here and be leaders here and have, have uh, great jobs here and all those things. And it, is that something that you're continuing to, to work for on our behalf? I'm really passionate about this, not just because I'm a young leader who's grown mm -hmm. up and work in Lake County, but it's important that we be responsive to our employers' needs. And when I go to visit Lake County employers, whether they're large or small, their number one concern is access to talent, and, mm -hmm. and particularly access to young talent, because a lot of their employees are or will be retiring mm -hmm. in the near future. And so the question becomes, what are we doing as, as uh, government leaders and as private sector leaders to create that environment that is attractive to young professionals. Mm -hmm. So we launched the Leadership Lake County Initiative. It has a steering committee of young professionals, as well as our HR managers that have a keen awareness of what their company's needs are. We've surveyed um, individuals who live and work in Lake County, as well as those who's, who don't. We've yeah. held focus groups all over Lake County. We did one here in Vernon Hills at American Hotel Register to learn about what we need to do. Mm -hmm. we're, we're compiling that report and we're gonna have more information in the first quarter of 2016. Okay. But what we're hearing is issues that we all care about. Access to transit, mm -hmm. uh, walkable communities, uh, access to recreation and the forest preserves. It's a huge selling point and differentiator for Lake County. Mm -hmm. And then on the private side, there's things that employers are doing to really be on the cutting edge when it comes to internship opportunities, mentorship opportunities, uh, what are called affinity groups for young professionals. And then some companies, based on their corporate culture, have a varying uh, policy when it comes to uh, telecommuting and okay. uh, different amenities that are offered on mm -hmm. site when it comes to fitness and all those sorts mm -hmm. of things. But we need to come together around a collective vision for this in order to be competitive. We're not competing for the early 20-somethings. They're going to want to go down to Lincoln <laughs> Park and Uptown and all those places. Uh -huh. But what we see from a uh, census statistical standpoint is once they get into their mid to uh, late 20s and early 30s, there is a trend where they are mo moving to the suburbs. Mm -hmm. That's where we need to be ready to catch them mm -hmm. and attract them back to Lake mm -hmm. County. And you said you've got a report that's going to be compiled. So mm -hmm. was that something that might be put on the website at some point? So it we can will. watch for that? Okay. It will. That might sounds like it would be something of interest to the employers and the employees to learn what's going on out there. And if somebody wants to get involved in your group, is that mm -hmm. something where if they have thoughts that they want to share or, or somehow connect, whether they're an employee or an employee. Can they get a hold of your office then? Call me at, at my office or send me an email. Okay. I was at a company in Waukegan talking about uh, how passionate I am about this issue. And actually, three months later, uh, Lake County Partners, our economic development uh, group, went back and they had started a young professionals <laughs> group. They were getting actively involved in local charities oh. through the United Way and volunteering. And they asked, why did you start this group? And they said, some guy named Aaron Lawler came and <laughs> talked to us about it. So it's those types of small yeah. victories that mean a lot. Yeah, well, and, and that's something, too, that I, uh, in the surveys I've been reading and things I've been reading, uh, people want to give back. Mm -hmm. Work has to be more than work. It has to feed you a little bit, too. Um, yep. And that's, that, that falls all right in together, that when you can make a difference in your world. So awesome. So if, you, if somebody wants to find out more and they want to see what people are doing, Give, give Aaron a call. Call his office, and, and we, can, we can keep making these changes. Yeah. So.
that's Lake County leadership. Um, now, another thing we wanted to talk about, it kind of goes back to budgeting, but I know something you're passionate about is sharing services and being efficient and, mm -hmm. and cutting out extra where it doesn't need to be and, and having people join together where they can. Are you still working to do those sorts of uh, uh, things where people work together on things? We are. So we're doing it uh, kind of two fronts. There's shared services, which is units of government coming together to jointly purchase things. Okay. Our best success story was our joint uh, SALT purchase where we have um, 45 agencies this year that jointly purchased 65,700 tons of SALT. <laughs> what we found is actually we are getting a better unit price than some of the other um, entities that do this type of joint procurement and so we're really growing our group of individuals. It's our municipalities, our township highway departments, but by doing a joint salt purchase and, uh, and being able to store that has a, a big impact on our bottom line. And it's all those uh, sorts of uh, shared mm -hmm. service initiatives. Everything down to elevator inspections. When you look at some of our communities, they don't have a lot of elevators to yeah. inspect, but you go in there, you see that little certificate yeah. that that you it's got, they got to be looked be. at every year, yeah. So we brought a bunch of people together. We saved $20,000. Mm -hmm. These little numbers uh, mm -hmm. do add up. Um, and then the other issue is looking at all of these units of government. You kind of touched on it. We have so many different units of government mm -hmm. in Illinois, more per capita than any other <laughs> state. You look at your tax bill and you have the mm -hmm. CV drainage district. Mm -hmm. uh, you, um, you might have a, you know, countryside fire, the county. Uh, school district, all these different mm -hmm. districts. I appoint 300 people to different boards and commissions, many of which have taxing authority. So we're trying to get the same legislative authority that you might have read about that DuPage County got in order to look at how we might consolidate some of these appointed districts that are appointed by the county board, uh, drainage, sanitary, mm -hmm. some other things, in order to save money for folks. Mm -hmm. uh, because it is daunting and it's it's unfortunate from a cost perspective because there's efficiencies to be had, mm -hmm. but it is not practical to think that our taxpayers and voters are going to be able to engage in their uh, different bill, you know, different right. lines on their tax body. Like, yeah, right. We can't expect that, and mm -hmm. so we have to make it more cost effective and easier for voters and taxpayers to be involved and understand what their elected and appointed leaders are doing for them. Now, how do you go about that? Is that you have to actually like change, you know, change constitutions or how, how, you know, the, for the county or how, how do you actually make changes like that? It's a, a legislative change that we're trying to get okay. done in Springfield. Um, okay. There was a bill to add McHenry and Lake. Mm -hmm. uh, McHenry had more issues with it than we did. So mm -hmm. we're, we're looking at it strategically and how okay. we can how, how we can do this. But it's really important and it's a dicey conversation because I'll talk to voters and they say, we absolutely need to consolidate. We have too many units of mm -hmm. government. And then you start providing the options and... But I don't want to do it with yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want that or I don't... It, right. it is hard because yeah. when, when you know it a certain way and you know the people that, that provide the work there, you do get protective of them. Mm -hmm. um, but, but it's nice to have that conversation and know that you're just looking at things to be efficient and, 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 and kind of make sense for things. And so hopefully we can get something through Springfield. We're, we're doing a big push on 911 consolidation, which okay. the village of Vernon Hills was a leader on. Mm -hmm. But countywide, uh, we've got a lot of opportunity spend uh, 33 million dollars a year on 911 dispatch we have a study that shows we could save up to 10 million dollars a year and provide the same or better service mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot of opportunity there and it's always great to be able to come from Vernon Hills and say yeah. we've already done that and we've done it and it works well here exactly. it works so well it's it's flawless here but it is hard you hear the other communities they worry what that means does that mean I'm not going to get my services quickly enough so it is. Everything ha Everything sounds good in the head and in the heart, kind of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and we're never gonna way. we're never gonna sacrifice quality of service right. for cost mm -hmm, savings. Mm -hmm. um, when minutes matter, you know. Right, uh, right. But but you can see where things make sense if we just figure out how to put it together and start yeah. doing that. So. 
Well, that's just a few of the things going on at the county level. Yep. And we're glad to know the county's working well because we don't ever we don't think about the county too much. So that's the good news. So yeah. thank you for all you've done for us on that. Now, if people want to find out more, um, I know your website is full of information. Mm -hmm. You do have meetings around where you talk with people. They can call into your office or send you an email. But mm -hmm. but do get involved. And that also it, it, it includes Lake County and the Lake County Forest Preserve. So anything with Lake County in it. Mm -hmm. If Aaron doesn't know what you, what you'd like to talk about, he'll find you who you need. Exactly. So, so start with Aaron, and you'll be good to go. So thank Thanks. you very much, and thank, uh, you. thank you for all that you and your staff and all the other representatives do. Thank you. are over on Greenleaf Drive at the Public Works Department. We're back in the big garage with all the snow equipment with Dave Brown, who's the uh, director of the Public Works Department. And uh, we've already had a big snow. As, as we're talking here now for people to watch in January, I can't imagine what January is going to bring. But you had a big snow already in November. I know you guys were ready. I know you do all the things to get ready. But that was a heck of a way to start the year. How are you guys doing over here? Yeah, I think we're doing well. We were prepared for the storm. Uh, it was a surprise that we got a record storm for November. Uh, depending if you were closer to Mundelein or Lincolnshire, it ranged between 18 inches in Mundelein and 12 in Lincolnshire. And uh, certainly it challenged us uh, because it was the first storm of the year. We learned a lot and we're more than prepared for this season. When you talk about getting prepared, I know you out, out in the back outside you've got giant bins fill, filled with salt. You've got like brine tanks. You've got all sorts of things. Can we go through some of the things you do to get your equipment ready, including the trucks and the things that you retrofit to, or, or you fit out with plows and things like that? Sure, sure. So we have a, a fleet of larger trucks. Uh, we have uh, two of them that have a wing blade on it. So instead of just having a plow in the front, it also has an extension that can reach over the curb and push back the, the snow. What it does is it allows most, more snow storage uh, for future snow events. Um, in terms of the amount of snow we have, uh, we, the capacity of our salt bin is 1,200 tons and they are completely full and we are, like I said, ready for the snow event. Well, a few years ago, I remember towns couldn't even get salt. And then when you did get it, you had to pay a premium. That wasn't a problem this year, I hope? Uh, we have some really good pricing on our salt. Uh, the, right now, where where salt is plentiful, uh, I think most pe most uh, municipalities are in the same position as us. So again, our salt bins are full. Uh, we are also complementing that with an anti-icing program. So we do use beet juice, and what we do with the beet juice is. Um, an anti-icing program, we go out ahead of the, the storm when it's anticipated and we try to put something down that'll prevent icing of the, the pavement. So we try to prevent it from bonding before we can get out there and start applying salt and plowing and uh, it really just makes it a safer condition and buys us a little time before we can react to the storm. And that's those when we see those lines on the pavement and the truck like putting down kind of it's almost counterintuitive when to see you putting moisture down on the road before we know there's a storm coming, but that's the purpose of that. It is. Uh, it's much like uh, if you're baking a cake. So you want to grease the pan before you put the cake in there, and then the cake will come out easier. It's just the. It's similar in terms of the, the ice on top of the roadway. It doesn't bond to the roadway once we put that down. So when you see those lines on the pavement, you know that uh, a snow event or icing event is coming. Okay. okay, so we should be extra careful then. And where do you get beet juice from anyway? Is that, you're not back here cooking up giant vats of beets, I assume. <laughs> well, uh, farmers are very good business people. Okay. <laughs> uh, so the farmers uh, not only sell their beet uh, products, but they also have found a reuse of it for the uh, the byproduct product. So with that byproduct, they've been able to find another uh, reuse, and we're glad that they did. So that's that pre-treating. Um, and when we talk about snow, I know you talked about the 12 to 18 inches of snow, but some of the times that are toughest for you, it's it's that um, icing period. It's like when it's changing over. I've heard you say before, it's that in-between time. We understand when we can see the snow on the ground, 
but we might not be as aware of how uh, how tricky and how, how what, what an effort it is for you guys to keep the roads clear when it's kind of that in between. Yeah, that's a really good point. I, I know many people know I'm from the Upper Peninsula, Michigan. Uh, we have a record snow of 390 inches of snow. Um, that's actually easy. You're just dealing with snow. Snow you can drive on. It has friction. What we deal with in this is really the snow belt, and it's you're going from freeze thaw back and forth multiple times throughout the overall winter, and that is more challenging. Yeah, ice is impossible to drive on, so we try to address the ice before it gets here. When it is here, we end up adding salt and uh, you know do the necessary measures to try to make things safer for the drivers. And as we talk again, to back up about snow, I know when you do have a big snow event like you did in November, those big ones where it's hard to, hard to keep up because you're having to keep making the rounds and you've only got so many people. I mean, uh, the village isn't flush enough that they're going to let you put on, you know, hundreds of people to get things yeah. taken care of. It's the same people doing everything. So I know you do have to prioritize and that's where we'll see sometimes some roads will get more attention. Sometimes you've got to come back later. Yeah, we absolutely have to prioritize uh, for the more recent storm that we were talking about. If it's a class three storm, so five inches of, of snow or more, or it's getting into a long duration, we cannot afford to have our, our team out there for, you know, 24, 36 hours, they need a break. Uh, it's a safety related measure. So we go into split shifts. Um, splitting the shifts means that team A is nine people, team B is nine people. In this more recent, it was a really wet snow and it caused a lot of broken branches. And so what that led to is those nine people were not only tackling the snow services, but they were also dealing with down branches and trees across the road and trying to open things up. We want to keep the roads open for, you know, for fire trucks, paramedics, et cetera, ambulances. And uh, it's, it's very important that we do both of those. So we do try to juggle things. In terms of priorities, the number one priority would be the larger streets, uh, more traffic, we need to pay more attention to those. It drops down towards the cul-de-sacs, which people travel at a slower speed. There's less vehicles, and they're important, but it's at a lower priority. And then there's sidewalks. When we get into a class three storm, we cannot keep up with the sidewalks, and so we take care of those, uh, the streets first, and then we'll drop back to the sidewalks. Sometimes it means we have to push snow towards the intersections and then come back with uh, front end loaders and then start removing or pushing snow around, and it's just a balancing act. Mm -hmm. and, and again, it's, you've only got so, much, so many resources, so many people trying to get it all done in time. Well, is that something, too, where people could go out maybe and and help a little bit, you know, uh, help dig out their fire hydrants and things like that. There's nothing wrong with going out and giving you a hand that way. Sure, not, not expected, but certainly uh, it, it's helpful if there is a fire hydrant in the area, if someone could shovel. Uh, that certainly helps the uh, fire department if there's uh, an emergency, a fire in that area, that they can get to that fire hydrant as quick as possible, hook up to it, and perform their operations. And we always like to remind people, even though you guys are great at pitching in with the county and pitching in with the state roads as needed really those are supposed to be taken care of by other entities so there are certain roads that we really shouldn't complain to you about at all well we, we try to help one another the uh, the states responsible for route 60 route 45 route 21 uh, Butterfield Road is a county responsibility but um, as we see that uh, they need some help and we're routing through for instance off of Greg's Parkway we may help uh, we may help uh, Libertyville slash IDOT, or we may help uh, uh, LDOT theirself. And before we back up again, I know you, you do have a lot of equipment here. You've got little trucks with diggers, you've got end loaders, you've got the big plows. And I just have to mention, you've got the giant V plow that's here for like the Snowmageddon. Have you ever had to use that, or am I jinxing us now? Uh, I hope you're not jinxing <laughs> us, um, but uh, we do have a large V-plow if it was ever needed. Uh, it was purchased years ago when uh, there was a large snow event with Washington, D.C., and you can remember people could not drive down their streets for weeks and weeks. Okay. So it is available. Should we need it, uh, we could add it to a front-end loader, and 
open up uh, streets. Uh, our wing plows, the two wing plows, have served us very well, and they have uh, reacted to that and kept our, uh, even in the worst storms of the last five years, they've been able to keep up with it. Well, thank you to you and your crews because we know that a lot of, you know, on-call, sleepless nights, waiting to see what's going on, keeping track of everything for us. So thank you for that. You. Um, and as we talk about when, when we back up and talk about branches being down, thank you because I, I know the guys then, you had to also route through the neighborhoods because people had so many down branches. So thank you. That wasn't something you planned to do. No, it wasn't planned. Uh, you know, I know I had a, uh, a pear tree that went down in my backyard. Uh, it's just, yeah, it's just really difficult. And, uh, you know, what are residents really going to, to do? They, they need our assistance. So we stepped forward, and uh, as long as they could bring it out to the curb, mm -hmm. we're routing up and down the streets, and we're uh, chipping them and hauling them away and, and uh, trying to get past that uh, episode. When I don't mean to put you on the spot because we're taping this in, in early uh, December, but... Uh, coming through again to pick up those uh, Christmas and holiday trees is that going to be scheduled it's it's always based on snow and things like that as well yeah we'll continue that program after the holidays uh, we'll make uh, laps through the village uh, for a few weeks and we'll be collecting those trees and uh, we do chip those up and recycle them well and then let's touch on a few things I know we've always talked before you guys are very, as careful as you can be and sometimes a mailbox goes down or sometimes things happen. So if that happens, there are numbers to call and you can go online and see. Um, but, but patience with everybody, please don't get angry, but you do have uh, remedies available. Yeah, mailboxes are, are difficult. This more recent storm, very, very wet snow. And um, the plows are not actually hitting the mailbox, what happens is it's the, the snow that gets pushed up against it. And if it's a little weak, it'll, it'll uh, knock over that post. Um, sometimes it's just as simple as the mailbox door is hanging over. And if it's hanging over the roadway and our plows and the extension off of the plow, it will hit that and it'll spin the mailbox. So uh, we do go through the village ahead of time and inspect mailboxes and try to see what condition they, they are. Um, I, I would just ask maybe homeowners could look at their mailbox and see the condition. Uh, mail's very important to people. So if we do happen to uh, impact their mailbox. Um, we do have a program. They contact our public works department, 847-367-3726, and we can share with them what the policy is and, and help them through that. But most importantly, we want to know about it so we can get a temporary mailbox where needed so they can get their mail. Yeah, exactly. When we talk to about just the things we have to do at home, you always say, well, well first of all, you're not supposed to throw your snow into the street. But it, from, from a standpoint of the homeowner, if you guys don't get over there and scrape through that, you could have uh, icy conditions in front of your driveway like all winter long. If it ices down, you just can't get that back up again. So how, how do you suggest people uh, throw their snow? Well, for, for the most part, you want to keep the snow off of the, the roadway itself. As you said, if, it, if we go through there and then snow is placed afterwards, it may bond to the pavement, and we may not have an opportunity of some warmer weather and scraping that's going to actually remove it. So it may be there for a while. That is a bump that someone would have to drive over uh, continuously until the situation improves. So uh, really the recommendation is when you're shoveling, um, you know which way the direction of travel and direction of our plows are. Try to put it to that side of your driveway so when we go by, we don't just take that bank and drop it back into your driveway. To try to put it on the, the, far, side. On the far side, and uh, I think that helps everyone. But really just trying to keep it within the parkway to the extent possible. Some people have very narrow uh, parkways, and I know what they struggle with. And then we also have that same struggle because we need to store snow somewhere and we're competing for that same area. Mm -hmm. well, and when we talk about th that's the same reason you s we're not to park on the streets overnight in the winter. But then if there is a snow emergency, you ask everybody to try to get your vehicles uh, off the streets so you can at least clean them up one time good. Absolutely. If there's a two inch snow or larger, uh, our police department helps us with making uh, uh, making the streets uh, accessible for our plowing operations. They may contact people to have them move their, their vehicles. But, uh, you know, when you see the storm, 
please uh, move them, your cars, into your driveway, and I, I think that helps everyone. We do understand there are some times when there's the uh, the Blackhawks playing in the uh, Stanley Cup, or there's holiday parties. Uh, people will want to have guests, and it's a festival, you know, festive time. So, um, as best as they can work with us and try to park on one side of the street, that certainly helps us. And I know people can always call the the police department too if you have a situation like that where you do need to do some overnight parking snow aside so um, well that's that's you guys you're all ready for snow we hope it's an easy winter any do you have any way of telling what kind of winter you're up again well there's always predictions right and this is supposed to be a mild winter <laughs> uh, it's, it's uh, November has been predicted very well yeah. five degrees warmer than anticipated uh, from a natural year and uh, that's what we're, we're seeing so far they're predicting that uh, in through the rest of the year but as a public works director when they tell me how much snow and what the conditions are I'd really like them to do a better job on the predictions and tell me, is it on overtime? Is it during regular time? Uh, is it coming all at once? Is it coming Monday through Friday or over the weekends? Is it over a holiday? Yeah. So um, if they can get that part right, yeah. uh, it'd make my life a lot yeah. easier. And it's not schedule it during rush hour drive time, right? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Well, thank you for all you and your crew do regarding the snow. And we also want to give thanks because we know, um, even though you're watching this in January, we have had a spectacular kind of alternative light show that your department was responsible for. The, the Cuneo Loyola grounds were no longer available. You guys uh, took the initiative to figure out how to power up some of these displays, which wasn't easy. It was a whole new thing, and it, it was beautiful. And I know it was a lot of work on the guys' part. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, kudos to all of the uh, Public Works elves that have uh, helped us through this process. Uh, we really miss uh, the Cuneo grounds and, you know, families have grown up around that uh, event. So Winter Wonderland is no longer afforded to us. And the village board thought it was really important to still have that, that same thing in Vernon Hills. So we looked at what displays we had. We looked at where our power availability was, and we've been able to uh, relocate them all through town. So we're getting some really nice calls of people talking about th whether it's their kids or their grandkids, they can still enjoy what they used to uh, around Vernon Hills. Well, and I've heard it's not the easiest thing because uh, Loyola grounds had like the safety features built in, the kind of power you had in, and because of the way you had to do things, you have for safety purposes kind of GFIs that turn things off, but that creates <laughs> A lot extra work for your elves when they have to go back and flip all the GFIs all the time. A absolutely. Uh, one of the reasons the Cuneo Loyola Winter Wonderland was uh, successful, it was a driving show, and so people didn't get out of their cars, so you could have a two-wire system that wasn't grounded. Well, now that they're in public areas, they are three-wire system attached to a ground fault interrupter, and ground fault interrupters, as you know, for your house, if you have a hair dryer that drops in the water, it shuts off the circuit. Well, in this instance, when you have snow that hits a light bulb, it melts, it touches the metal, it trips the circuit. So at night, we are going around and resetting and drying and doing what we can because uh, it reflects on our department and our village. We really want all the lights to, to work all the time. Um, that is going to be our biggest challenge for this year, and uh, you know we're we're up for the challenge. Uh, we just uh, hope everyone understands that it's uh, that is the reason. We're not neglecting it by any means. Uh, it's going to take a lot of man hours to get around town and make it successful. Thank you, thank you for all the work you and your crews do. We appreciate it very much. Uh, here's to an easy winter and and no. Uh, ice or snow uh, during rush hour and uh, and uh, if you have questions or you want to know more if you have something you want to bring to public works attention you know send an email give a call over here they're working on a lot of things and they'll, they want to work together on our behalf so thank you very much appreciate the time and thanks to all your crew thank you I appreciate it
we are at the Vernon Hills Village Hall to formally introduce you to our new incoming finance director, Nikki Larson. Now many of you may have met her before because she's been around the village for quite a while, but uh, we wanted to take the time and come over to, to meet her. And Nikki, thank you for taking the time. And you are stepping into the role that uh, Larry Nacrin filled for 31 years as he retires, correct? So you're the new, what's your new title? Uh, my new title will be finance director. Excellent. But it, even though that's a new title for you come January, um, you, you have a lot of familiarity with the village because you've been here actually quite a while and you've been working with him. Can you tell a little bit about that transition time and when you did start here? Sure. I started at the village in June of 2015. Um, I started working for Larry as his assistant finance director, helped him through the budget process and the audit process. Um, started to get familiar with the computer systems and the staff and the processes here um, and have really learned a lot from him over the last 18 months. Okay, so, mm -hmm. so you are, uh, that would be called a seamless transition. You guys are ready, you work together and now he's, he's going to go off hopefully and retire and have a good time and you're ready to go. Right? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Let's talk about your life before Vernon Hills. Now are you from the area where you're familiar with this area? Where did you grow up? Uh, well, I grew up, I was born and raised in Palatine, um, so I am familiar with this area and the surrounding area. I started my career in Palatine. I started working for the Village of Vernon Hill, or Village of Palatine um, about 10 years ago. Um, and then after I left um, the Village of Palatine, I went to the city of Highland Park as their deputy finance director. Um, I was there for about three years, um, and I became their finance director. Um, and then shortly thereafter, I came over to Vernon Hills. Well, and those town, Palatine and, and Highland Park, um, they've been around for a long time, and they're, and they're quite a bit bigger than we are. We've been kind of that, that village that moves and grows, and, and we're finally kind of like hitting our point where we're probably not going to get all that much bigger. So you're, you're really bringing a lot of, um, uh, of those kind of skills and things to that. Are you finding that you can translate a lot of that over to what we're going to do as we like kind of settle down here? I do. Um, there's a lot of similarities between the towns. Uh, Palatine's quite a bit bigger. Their population's about 70,000. Um, the city of Highland Park has some differences. Um, they do provide water for their residents, so they have a water treatment plant, um, full-service police and fire. So it is a little bit different, but uh, what I'm finding is that um, we can bring a lot of the good experiences from the other towns to help improve things here at Vernon Hills. Uh, things run very smoothly here, but there's always room for, you know, if we can find an efficiency or a better way to do things. That's, that's interesting to think about. Now let, let, let's talk about what, what is the main role of a finance director. We won't make you go into all the details, but we kind of know it's the money. It's the numbers. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, as the finance director, you are the sole custodian of funds um, for the village and the village pension fund. Um, so on a day-to-day -day basis, you manage the investments in the village, the cash, cash collections, um, and then on an annual basis, you're responsible for the budget and making sure all the expenditures come in online, uh, watching the revenue sources, um, and then we also do an annual audit, um, which ensures that everything's being accounted for correctly village-wide. And those are the main main items. Okay. And as we're looking, we're, as, we're, as people are watching this in January, I'm assuming that's budget time for here. I know that we have a different kind of fiscal year than the calendar year, but can you talk a little bit about that process? Sure. Um, the departments are all starting the budget process now. Um, the village has an April 30th year end, so we are um, beginning that process now in preparation with hopefully um, a budget to be passed in the end of March or beginning the end of March. Um, we do have some struggles this year. Um, the village is affected by the state of Illinois budget crisis, so that has posed some challenges this year that haven't been there every year. Um, but we have done a very good job in being proactive and planning ahead for those types of things um, that could affect the village, potentially impact. Um, so our hope is that it'll be a very seamless transition from one year to the next. And I know we've, we've had uh, uh, John Kelmar and others have talked about how uh, things in Springfield do impact because there's there's funds that come from down there to us and if you don't think you're going to get them you have to then um, go into the reserve funds but we do have reserve funds for those kind of things. That is true. Um, Larry's done a great job managing the finances over the years so we do have sufficient reserve funds. Uh, that's you know not something we want to do every year but it's definitely something to um, help us manage as we transition from one phase to the next. 
So that's that's kind of the, the the role of the finance director in like a nutshell. We know there's a lot more ins and outs in your staff, and you are all working together, as is the entire staff of the village. So thank you for that. Um, if people want to find out more, um, there is information always on the website. There's usually hearings and things like that, so you can look at the budget as it starts coming together. That's true. Um, we will have the proposed budget out um, after January. That'll be up on the website. There's a financial documents web page. That's completely updated, so you can look back um, several years and see the historic information for the finance department and also the contact information for us as well. So if somebody does have inf uh, uh, questions or they want to talk more, they can get a hold of you or some other, other people in the finance department. Absolutely. Yes. Well, thank you so much, and I guess a formal welcome to you, even though you've been here uh, for quite a while. Uh, congratulations on your new role as finance director. If you want to find out more, do go online listen to the board meetings, come on over and, and, and be at the board meetings, um, give a call over here and everybody's ready to try to uh, make sure that we're all up to date and we're all on the same page and we know what's going on. So thanks for taking the time. We appreciate it. Thank you. Well, that wraps up this edition of The Vernon Hills Update. If you have comments or suggestions, please contact Mike Storto at 847-918-3560 or email Mike S at vhills.org. Thank you for tuning in to the Vernon Hills Update.